I know you but said you my name know, wrong. Because you heard me. <laughs> <laughs> what are we looking for? Hey, we are going live. It should just take a moment or two. And it looks like we are live. Oh, righty. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Ask Me to Public Library's virtual author chat series. Today's chat is in partnership with the Rift Bodice Bookstore, where you can purchase books by all of the authors that are with us today. I'm one of your hosts, Jessica, Adult Services Librarian. And I am Kathy Janovitz, our Teen Services Librarian. And today we are joined by authors Katie Kingman um, and Sophia Jean. I'm going to do it again. It's horrible. And Sophia Juano and um, Anuradha Rajuka. And welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It's so good to be here. We're so excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And for everyone watching while we're live, not later. If you have any questions for the authors, please feel free to add those to the Facebook comments and we will ask them as they come up. So let's just start off with tell us a little bit about you. And Katie, I'm going to go with you first because I know that you are prepared and you are ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, first and foremost, I'm a mom and I teach high school. I teach um, British literature and creative writing and I teach a film class. So I kind of feel like my days are immersed in stories in different ways. Um, and then, gosh, when I get home, I feel like I'm reading with my kids. But I keep it at four books every night. At this point, they're like, can we maybe do two? And I'm like, no, we're still going to do four, guys. So um, yeah, that's me. Um, what else? I guess I, I feel like I am being an author now to wear so many different hats, but all of them are kind of worked around story in some way or another. Yay, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you for taking the time away from the family and the cat. Yeah, no <laughs> problem. With us. No problem. Okay, and now I'm going to do it, Kathy. What? And Rada. Beautiful. Yes? Perfect. Um, so yeah, my name's Anurada, and I my YA contemporary debut is called American Betia. And um, it was published by Knopf about two months ago now. I feel like I can't believe it's already been two months. Um, so I am a teacher as well. And I've taken a leave of absence from my teaching responsibilities to just meet some of my deadlines. And, um, and so it's interesting because now I am just kind of writing full time, which is really different from how I wrote American Betia, which I know we'll talk about that later. But um, it's just really strange. I wake up in the morning, I come to my little office, uh, which is actually a closet, which is where I'm sitting right now. And I just work through the mornings. Um, so it's actually just a really strange and kind of luxurious to have so much open time to be writing. Um, I also love gardening and I'm a mom of two teen boys. And um, they're both readers. They both were really involved in the kind of editing of American Betia. So that was cool. Um, and that's about it. Oh, thank you. I feel like we're two for two right now for teachers, but that might change. And Sophie, let's hear a little bit about you. <laughs> That, that's where you that's where it stops <laughs> although I do come from a teaching family <laughs> everyone everyone bought me pretty much in my family is a teacher <laughs> um so I'm Anne-Sophie Joano and I'm the author of Kisses and Croissants um I am French which is where the accent comes from if you've been wondering and I have spent most of my adulthood living around the world so outside of France, I've lived in Amsterdam, then in Melbourne in Australia, where my husband is from. And I've been in New York City since 2011. So I'm coming on 10 years uh, in a couple of months. Um, I'm actually a full-time writer. I have been for 10 plus years already. Um, Kisses is my uh, US debut, but I have published a lot uh, with a French publisher because I write in both languages. And I have a lot of other writing related jobs, including um, copywriting. I worked in advertising for many years. So that was kind of a natural progression for me. And that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us and sharing about yourself. And I'm gonna let Kathy get on to the next question. Okay, I was, I was closing my side panel thingy. <laughs> 
Okay, ladies. So when did you first start reading romance and how did you make the journey from a reader to a writer? You want me to start off again? Sure. Okay. Um, gosh, you know, I, when I thought about this, it was kind of an embarrassing story um, <laughs> because when I was much younger, are there embarrassing stories when it comes to re reading? I suppose maybe not, but um, uh, when I was much younger, I feel like I was maybe around 12. I was also trying to think about how old I was. It was so long ago. I found an old copy of Outlander in a cabin that we were renting in Maine. Um, and I was there with my dad and my siblings. And I just picked this book off the shelf, which I was obviously way too young for. And um, I started reading it and I was really enjoying it. And I remember having to leave it at the house, the cabin we're renting and being really sad about that because I hadn't gotten to finish it yet. And my dad actually went back and took the book and mailed it to me in Arizona. So um, if he had known, I'm sure what it was about, he may not have made that choice, but um, that was kind of like my first uh, adventure into reading romance. And then from there, it was my stepmother's uh, Nora Roberts novels like The Reef and such. Um, and I just yeah, fell right into it. But then how did I become a writer? Well, and for young adult, that was when I read uh, The Winner's Curse by Marie Rutkowski. I was just so enamored with her writing and it, I don't know why, but it just kind of struck something in me that said, I need to try this. I need to be doing this. And I did. And here we are. Oh, yay. That's awesome. Um, I would love to just start with maybe the journey because I feel like that's kind of the um, natural place to begin with this question for me. Um, I was a really shy kid um, and I was growing up in a, like a predominantly white town in the Midwest and just really um, like kind of painfully shy. So reading was where I kind of found my friends and found myself and felt really connected. Um, and so around the time I was like maybe seven or eight, I started journaling. And I always was just sort of, um, you know, just a quiet kid, but I, I had really close relationships with my um, English teachers at pretty much every grade that I can remember. I mean, starting, I guess, in high school, especially. Um, so there was um, one English teacher where we did some journaling back and forth. So I would write a page and then she would respond to it, which back then felt really like revolutionary. I don't know, maybe it was kind of revolutionary at that time, because I know it's like really common now, but um, I was going through a lot of things and it just felt like I was receiving so much positive reinforcement from this adult figure, you know, that I never really had before um, outside of my parents. Um, and she was the one who was kind of like suggesting different titles and telling me that, you know, my, my writing reminded her of different things. And it was just, I'd never really seen myself as a writer. I mean, I sort of dreamed of it, I think sort of subconsciously, but it wasn't until she would, you know, was talking about it that I started to sort of see myself in that way and dream about that. Um, I loved all the rom-com movies at the time. And so I was, I loved Lois Duncan. I remember reading Flowers in the Attic, which is like, I don't even think that's really romance. That's just like, I don't know. But there is a romance in there and there's some darkness in there, which I kind of love a little bit of darkness in my romance. And so I, I do feel like that played a role. Um, but you know, when Harry met Sally, um, happy together, like some of those eighties, you know, of course, all the John Hughes films. Um, but I, again, I didn't really like see myself in any of those stories and not that I was like aware of it. I mean, as an Asian American, you kind of don't expect to see yourself almost in your, in the stories. And, but there was on some level like a feeling of I really want to write a story that kind of reflects a little bit more what my experiences have been and those of my friends and um, you know characters that remind me of my family and so um, I knew that one day I wanted to tell a love story that explored um, you know like the intersection of love and culture and sex and respect and um, I ended up kind of having an idea for American Betia in that in that time, like I was maybe 16 or 17. So that's where I began. Um, for me, I think I was, I think I was always a reader and a writer. Um, I don't have great memories of books 
I read as a kid. And I think part of it is because a lot of it was translated from American, I think. And I would probably know the French titles, but not the American ones. So um, I, I should look it up actually one day, but I just, I don't even have great memories of the titles, but I think I just always loved, even before reading books, like as physical objects, I always found them really beautiful. I love seeing rows and rows of books. And yeah, that's really um, something that always, felt special to me. Um, I grew up in the country, like in the dead of the country. So there was nothing else to do. <laughs> I, also, um, I also grew up in a school. Like I said, my dad was a primary school principal and, um, or like, sorry, I didn't say that. Like I come from a teaching family and my dad was a primary school principal and we lived on, on the premises. And uh, yeah, so I had, I had books around and I always, it's just something I always naturally gravitated towards. Um, and then the first ever time, I, I was never um, hand, like um, I, I was never someone who liked writing by hand. And pretty much the first time I came in contact with a computer, I was eight. I'm dating myself now, but that's the that's the truth. Um, and I just opened the word treatment process or whatever it was at the time and just started typing a story. It was just like I, I wasn't trying to say anything specific. I wasn't trying to do anything. It's just the only thing that seemed like a natural thing to do on, on a computer. Um, so yeah, and I think my love of reading feeds my writing and my writing feeds my love of reading and then it's an endless loop and that's pretty much my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like all of us have our TBRs that keep growing and growing and growing and growing. And who knows if we'll ever finish them, but it's kind of nice having, knowing that there's something else to read. It's comforting. <laughs> So now that we've heard a little bit about you and kind of your journey to becoming writers, tell us a little bit about your books. Should we just continue with our Katie first and everything? Okay, let's do it. Katie, you're up. That's fine. Tell us about um, well, your my book, uh, Down With This Ship, is coming from Fluffs on June 8th. And it is, um, yep, there's the cover right there. It's really um, my kind of a love letter to fandom and um, what I, I see to be a really um, beautiful and open place that can also at times be rather unforgiving. Um, there's, there's almost uh, kind of a, a code in certain fandoms and it varies from fandom to fandom. And um, this was kind of my exploration of, of that idea. Um, but it's, uh, it's about a girl who is a secret celebrity in the fandom world. She writes fan fiction for her favorite show, which is called The Space Game. Um, and she one day finds herself in a bind when some of the bullies in her creative writing class discover that she's the one who's writing this very blog. And um, Cole, who is quite the introvert, uh, now has to decide if she wants to kind of claim her identity now in this very, um, in a, a more public, yes, like online, but now in a very personal uh, way. And so she she kind of has to earn back her blog when they take some control of it through what feels like, when I think back, kind of a series of quests, I suppose. So it, it kind of brings in fandom in all sorts of different ways. So yeah, and that'll be out on June 8th. Sounds so good. Um, um, so American Vithya is a, it's a cross-cultural love story about 18-year-old Rani who gets swept in the euphoria of first love when she first meets Oliver, but it is the challenges that they encounter as an interracial couple that allow her to recognize ultimately real love for what it is. Um, so it's a story that, um, gosh, it explores immigrant families, shifting personal boundaries, and the complicated relationship between love and culture. And it also features a lot of just like funny best friend banter, Indian food, um, feminist, bad assery, I guess, um, sex positivity, um, intergenerational experiences, and a really illuminating trip to India where Rani gets to meet a lot of her family and kind of learn a little bit more about her traditions and her heritage and how that impacts her sense of self. I, uh, I read American Bittia and uh, I can concur that all of those things are very, <laughs> it's a great description. Of course, it's your own book, so you can Thank describe you. it well, but I loved, I was thinking through like what I love the most about it. And not all of those things that you describe are, are extremely well done. And it's a very beautiful book that I really enjoyed. 
on that, um, uh, having that, sorry, moving <laughs> on. Um, not sure how to move on from that, but anyway, kisses and croissants. <laughs> My novel <laughs> is in a different vibe. Um, it's about Mia, an aspiring ballerina who gets accepted into a very exclusive um, summer intensive dance program in Paris. Um, there she has six weeks to snag an audition with the American Ballet Theater. But um, as soon as she arrives, she meets Louis, a very, very, very cute French boy, <laughs> the fantasy French boyfriend. <laughs> and well, you know, she thought she was in Paris to dance and only to dance, but romance gets in the way. Uh, at the, um, and at the same time, there's a family legend in, um, in, Mia's, in Mia's family that her great, great, great grandmother, I never know how many greats it is, but I think it's three, <laughs> uh, was painted by Edgar Degas and uh, was featured in one of his famous paintings. And while she's in Paris, Mia has sort of this idea that maybe she could explore this family legend a little bit more. And Louis gets very excited about it. He's into, he's into art and he's into getting up to all sorts of adventures. So um, together they go looking for that painting. And that's all I'll say, so I don't spoil anything. <laughs> Oh. I love them all. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we need to go now because we need to continue to read. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be us not talking. We're all just sitting here reading. <laughs> no one talking. Okay. Thank you so much for telling us about your books. Um, they all sound amazing. I got an advanced reader copy of Down With This Ship on Edelweiss and I've only gotten like a quarter of the way through it, unfortunately, but it's super fun. Thank you. It reminds me a teeny bit of the uh, fangirl from Rainbow Rowell, just the concept of like writing fan fiction. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's got the snippets in there too. Um, it's, yeah, it's got the little pieces of it interspersed that kind of, um, uh, there's some connections that you can make with some of the plot and such. And it's, yeah, it's very similar. Which I like. Uh, thank you. Lovely. Um, let's see. What are we doing now? Oh, yeah. Let's see. What inspired you to write these stories? I know a few of you have sort of touched on, on that as you spoke about your books, um, but tell us a bit more about what inspired you to write these specific stories. Yeah, well, I mentioned that um, I started writing uh, because I had read The Winner's Curse and I was just so moved by it that I thought to myself that I, I wanted to start writing, um, which led me to write um, my space opera, which uh, is actually what the space game is based on within Down With This Ship. Um, so the snippets of the fan fiction are actually my first novel, which um, is uh, just kind of this very dramatic story. It's um, got a very different tone than Down With This Ship does. But um, from there, then I was inspired to write Down With This Ship because I actually um, got kind of involved in a little bit of drama on Twitter. Um, I got dragged a little bit because I had tweeted something about um, a ship that I really enjoy. And I just thought to myself, after I logged out and kind of had to remove myself from the situation, I just thought to myself, what would happen if you were the creator of a ship and you couldn't just log out? What if you were, if this, drama came into your every day, like your high school, and suddenly people were coming up to you in the halls and were talking to you about your show and were telling you their opinion. Um, and that, from there, Down With The Ship was born and I knew I needed a world to immerse my fan fiction writer in. And so I went back to The Seven Skies and pulled excerpts from that to kind of fill Down, down With The Ship around. So um, yeah, so it, believe it or not, it was, it was some trolls online that inspired me. <laughs> <laughs> People can get passionate about their ships. I know that I am, and I will go down with the ship, even if it's exactly. mm -hmm. my ship. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I did touch a little bit on it, but I, I was really interested in the idea um, for American Betia, the idea of cultural conflict within interracial relationships. I feel like with our society becoming so diverse and 
you know, interracial relationships are so common. I wasn't seeing that as much in YA as I kind of thought I would, or, and not to say that it hasn't been written about, I just personally hadn't really read anything um, that was handling some of those relationships in the way I was hoping to. And I was also really interested in the idea of escapism. So what happens when we escape into another person, which happens a lot in especially young love. Um, and then what happens if you're sort of escaping into another person's culture? Um, and just, I was also, you know, kind of an aside interested in this idea of racism and bias. We always think of that as happening, you know, from bullies um, in hate, you know, with hate crimes, but really rarely do we talk about or think about the fact that it can often happen within our closest like circles, you know, whether it's friendships or even love, you know, romantic relationships. Um, so many of us feel like a sense of invisibility during our teen years and which is kind of I talked I talked a little bit about that before and like how we're sometimes seen in this very like narrow kind of a way and so like you're on the fringes and you kind of are longing for belonging and longing for love I think that's a really common experience no matter what culture or what you know part of the world you're from um so sort of that question of like, how far will we go for love? Like once you get, once you find yourself in love, what will you do to keep that love alive and going? And how much of yourself are you going to sort of compromise if that if it comes to that? Um, so that role, that culture and family traditions, like what role does that play in love, which I mentioned before. Um, so basically like, how do you find yourself? How do you find yourself when you're entangled in this kind of like heady, chemical, um, swoony kind of love. And um, so that was, those were some of the questions I was just sort of hoping to answer in the writing of the book. Um, for me, it was, I mean, for me, it all started with the setting with Paris. Um, I grew up in a tiny little village, just about 40 minutes outside of Paris. And I always had that really fantasy about the city itself. I think we weren't able to go, um, I didn't end up going all that much when we were, I mean, I would have gone all the time if I'd been up to me. So I think we went like once, twice, three times, sometimes on school trips um, a year. And I think it, it was always this really aspirational, romantic, beautiful city in my mind. And I always almost moved there many times and it never happened, uh, still hasn't. <laughs> and, but I do go back, you know, frequently, obviously not recently, but I, I, I go there quite a lot. And, uh, and anyway, I've always, I, that has never faded. Like my love for the city, my enjoyment of it, the, the monuments, the history, the, I felt like the romance that's in the air. Um, so for me, it was always this idea of like a love story set in Paris that is also a love story with Paris. And Mia was such an interesting character. I found to, to explore that, um, uh, to, to explore that with because She's not one of those, there's a lot of study abroad YA novels that are about like, oh, I have to go to Italy for the summer, you know? And I think when I read those, it's like, oh, and I, I would read those and go, really? Like, you have to go? Like, that's, that's, a, that's your hardship. <laughs> and of course, that's a story device, but I just really, you know, Mia wants to be there. She wants to be there to dance, but I think she has this family connection with it and, uh, and anyway, so she very much sees the city, I guess, how I see it, you know, as an outsider. And so not how I see it from that perspective, but just like she just really gets swept off her feet immediately by the city, even before she meets Louis, I think. Um, and, and I loved how um, the, the, the artistry and the beauty of ballet and the paintings, because she spends a lot of time in museums and looking at paintings for the famous painting. And that, for me, those three elements really just combine together really well um, to make a, a very upbeat, um, lighthearted story that was also quite whimsical and, and extremely romantic and unapologetically so. <laughs> I could keep and going. for those but... who, no, <laughs> well, of course, for those that, suddenly are just very intrigued by these books, a reminder that you can purchase them from the Rift Bodice bookstore or your local bookseller. So go out and find those books. Okay, on to our next question. We're skipping a little bit. What is it about the romance 
genre that you are drawn to. So what is it about these romance stories that is something that you enjoy? I mean, obviously, because but let's see, Katie. Yeah. Well, I got to use a word that comes right from fandom here for this one. For me, it's all about the feels. Um, it, it's about every stage, um, flirtation and attraction. Um, I even love those stories that incorporate jealousy somehow. Um, I think, Emirata, you said a little bit about, I mean, like a little darkness. And I completely agree. I am all about those ups and downs and that angst. Um, I, I know so many people love the enemies to lovers tropes, but even just for me, a little disagreement here or there is, I, I'm sold on that. Um, so it, it, it always, it, I love the happy endings, of course, but I love how I also have started to see books that don't always have that forever idea behind them. Um, I tried to capture that too here in Cole's story very much. There's um, an ending to the book that's like, hey, this is really, this is really great. Let's see where this goes. But um, does this mean happily ever after, like a fairy tale type story? Who knows? We'll see. Um, but I, I love just all of those feelings that are so much fun to put on the page. I love the drama, every emotion. I like it all. I am with you. Oh my gosh, I'm so with you. I mean, I feel like I'm just like a sucker for those simmering love stories, whether it's movies or, I mean, and ever since the beginning of time, I've always sort of been drawn to those stories. Um, and and like even those stories that are somewhat like dysfunctional or have that like dollop of desperation or whatever, um, like for instance, the time traveler's wife, that's one of my favorites. And there's so much longing, you know, he's he's gone from her and they've got they never know when they're going to come back together. And um, I feel like balancing that darkness with the light is like it just aids with tension just as a writer there's so much to work with there there's so much like internal energy in that um and it also prevents things from getting too gooey you know like you don't i mean there's i love cheesy stuff too it's not that i'm you know par impartial but um but yeah i do feel like that desperation makes it kind of easy to incorporate also other issues if you want to explore you know any like social justice kinds of issues that I feel like our teens are dealing and we all are dealing with so much nowadays. Um, so there's a way to you know play that against the chemistry and um, yeah I mean I think that sort of you can also discover a new side to yourself through another person and so that concept is really interesting to me that you don't you know, being with a person in a romantic way, it sort of, it reveals to you a certain side of yourself that, you know, an, a facet that you haven't yet discovered. And so, especially in young love. And so I, I do think that there's so much kind of discovery that's it. There's also, of course, just, um, you know, when you think about like sexual tension and the like, you know, feelings of awakening, you know, there's just, there's so much like heady, headiness there that um, is just fun to play with kind of what you were saying, Katie, it's just there's so much there to work with. So that's, that's where I would I, so just yeah, leaning into that in into that truth in the stories is so much fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree and feel the same with both of you and kind of feel the same way. I think for me, I, I need, I know romance is a genre, right? But I need a little romance in my stories. And I mean, as a as reader and as a, a viewer, I this is really what makes me tick. I need the romance, I need the friendships as well, which for me are like very similar types of relationships. I think especially in young adults, um, the relationships you can have with your friends, with your close, you know, with your close friends can be as intense and as tension filled and as full of conflicts as your romantic relationships. I feel it's really, a yeah, a time in your life where those, those two relationships, those two types of relationships kind of blend um, in some ways in, in, in the, the intensity is what I'm trying to say and how important they are um, in your daily life. And I think, yes, like, so for me, it's, it's, it's less about the romance romance is like as a genre is more like I just I just it's extremely corny but I love love I will always want to hear love stories whether they're real people stories or fictional or anything like give me all of the love <laughs> I'm a very good audience for it I will just like cry and cheer and all and all of the things um 
So, so I'm like losing my train of thought. So what attracted me? Yeah, I mean, I, think, I also think to be honest, I, it's kind of writing as an adult for young adult, it's kind of fulfilling a fantasy. Like I did not have a lot going on in my romantic life as a teen. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> But when I was writing Louis, um, I just thought, you know what, I'm going for the, the fantasy French boyfriend. He will be extremely handsome. And not that everything works out perfectly well, but he will, he will say the right things and he will like really swoop her off our feet. He, he must. I need him to do that. <laughs> I wrote him for me. Um, meanwhile, my Australian husband is probably hearing me saying this and like rolling his eyes. <laughs> you know, dreams move on. Dreams move on. <laughs> oh, I love that. My cheeks hurt from how much I'm smiling. <laughs> that's so true. Yeah, we all got so excited by that question. Well, now that's so into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the same way. I love love too. I will find a love story in a movie or a book. <laughs> no love story. I will find it. You're like, look at the way they're looking at each other. I think they might like each other. And then nothing ever happens. And you're like, where did it go? Yeah. That's why there's fan fiction. Exactly. You just made it up in your mind. That's your head can. Yeah. Okay. So our next question. Do you have a favorite romance trope? Something that you like to use or like to read that you find super fun? Yeah, I, I went with forced proximity in this one because that encapsulates so much. Um, I thought about that scene in Leap Year where they have to share a bed. I don't know if you guys have seen that movie with Amy. I Robert, love that movie. Right? Oh my goodness. They have to share a bed or riding a horse together, which of course is in Outlander and in Shadow and Bone. And I, oh, I'm all about that trope. Um, and I feel like I, on every soap opera, I've seen people locked in rooms together um, for, there was a, a Netflix movie I watched where they were locked in a freezer together all night. Um, I wish I can't think of the title right now, but that kind of forced proximity, especially when they kind of don't like each other, that, that, yeah, that's my thing. I love it. I think it's so cute. <laughs> I love elevator. Oh. Elevators are the best. Yeah. Oh, it broke. So she gets to get yeah. stuck. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. How unfortunate. What should we do while we're in here? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Um, this was a hard one. There are so many great romance tropes. Um, I mean, I guess I would say forbidden love. I just feel like there's so much, again, there's so much like built in tension. There's, there's, um, it's so easy for it to devolve into something obsessive and psychological and dark and which I apparently am obsessed with. Um, I, and it's like, it just goes back to Romeo and Juliet. Like I remember studying that book and being so kind of, amazed that we can study that in school like especially back then I mean I just feel like we were reading kind of some boring books and then that one came along and I was like oh my gosh so I think it goes back to like a memory you know like a childhood memory as a trope forbidden love so that would be mine <laughs> Um, I like all of the tropes. I feel like I, I love the execution of the trope. I think I just really enjoy how, you know, prose and stories um, come together. So I feel like if a trope is done well, I'm all for it. Uh, my specific favorite ones are also Forbidden Love and its cousin Secret Love, which I mean, they're not always like they don't always go. I guess they often go hand in hand, but sometimes it can be secret without being forbidden. And there is an element of secret romance slash slightly forbidden romance in Kisses and Croissants. I mean, it's very, it's somewhat mild. I mean, it is a very upbeat story, but I just, exactly like you said, Anurata, it's just, I just love, like, I love the drama. <laughs> I just love the drama. And I feel like in this day and age, um, it's so hard to create a forbidden love story. I mean, yes, there are aspects of culture and, and religion, but I think generally speaking, it is, it is harder and I can't tell you how much time of my day I spend thinking like, how can I make this a forbidden love story like for new projects you know like how can they not be together <laughs> but really want to be um anyway so yeah those two and just an element of secret I think you know there's something slightly boring about 
being able to just like if you I mean in real life it's great if you just meet someone and you fall in love and you're happy together sure but that is not a good story <laughs> if you have you know if things are keeping you apart I think that's more what I like like if there's an element of what can you know what can keep them apart I really like that <laughs> I love all the tropes I love talking about all the tropes I feel like there's always a combination you know, there's always a few that are somehow all mixed together. And it's like the more the merrier. Like just pile them, them, them. them together. Yeah. Take all yeah. of them and write it into one book. Everything. <laughs> they don't, don't like each other. They get stuck in elevators. They're technically cousins. I don't know. Something. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> we can squeeze it all in there. Well, maybe they're pretending to be cousins. So fake relationship. But then they're also fake dating. <laughs> There's just so many things. Okay. I'm going to check to see. I know there are people watching, but they haven't commented, so I can't see their name. So the people watching, thank you for being here with us. And the people watching later, thank you for watching this later. <laughs> and now to the next question. Let's see. Is there anything about publishing that surprised you? So something that you didn't expect? You know, you I didn't really, expect. Yeah, I, I was surprised about how long it all takes. <laughs> um, uh, from reading to contracts to decisions being made, um, I think just uh, working in an environment where deadlines are constant, um, there's always an end date for something. I was really surprised at how long it, it, it all takes and all for very valid reason. Uh, it just is, oh, it of course feels twice as long as the person um, you know, waiting uh, for the work to be critiqued or whatnot for decisions to be made based on the work. So that, that was surprising and difficult at times. Yeah. yeah. I was interested in how, what a different skill set it is to write a book, like a book of your heart, and then have to talk publicly about the themes of that book of your heart without giving spoilers. Like, it's like, okay, how do I do this? And so I, it was really, I allowed myself a very like long, steep learning curve. I was like, okay, this is stressful. And I think just as an introvert, it was like really difficult to, you know, you're in like a fugue state when you're writing, you know, you're writing from somewhere deep inside of you. And then it, which is so interior. And then to be kind of exterior about it and share about it and talk about it. And, you know, it just, um, that was something that I really had to like, I mean, kind of what we were talking about, Katie, before we all started, you know, just with notes, like I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to have notes for everything <laughs> when talking about this book. And you would think that like, I'm the, I, I wrote the book, like I'm the, you know, I am the boss of the book. It shouldn't be this hard. And yet it was so hard to figure out how to like kind of distill down, you know, the themes and talk about it in a way that's coherent. And um, so that was kind of a surprise to me, like how little time I had thought about that component of writing and promoting and, you know, sharing. And, um, but it's also been really great in some ways to, um, you know, like sometimes reading reviews. I'm like, oh, that person explained that 5,000 times better than I could ever have. So utilizing, you know, the wonderful feedback that you receive or even the not so wonderful feedback. I mean, you can use all of it when you learn how to sort of talk and share about the book. So that was a surprise. I think mine was also about the length, you know, the length of time, but what I find really interesting is um, I remember when we sold um, Kisses and Croissants, finding out that it was going to go into come out two years later, which felt like forever. Like I'm a very impatient person and I clearly picked the wrong industry because <laughs> nothing moves slower than publishing. <laughs> but um, so, you know, trying to like, yeah, like bide my time and just like be a bit more patient. I just had that date in my mind about when the book would come out. And then eight months early, I start getting reviews and people reaching out to me and things like that. And I think it was just that was a bit of a surprise because even though, yes, there's usually really long lead times, that, that is because things are happening 
internally that as the author you don't necessarily see you you don't really see the the, the internal progress right so right now um my next novel, which come out, comes out in fall 2022, I'm putting together cover ideas for the designer. And it's just like, it's it feels so early. Um, and it feels so early, but they're launching. So to give you an idea, I think they're launching the fall 2022 season in September. So when you, re when you think about that, it's actually not that much time between now and then to go back and forth on the cover. I don't know that it has, it has to be finalized by September, but it has to be pretty much almost almost there so it's it's kind of fascinating to me like all the things that happen in advance and how far out they need to happen and I think it's the same as the work with librarians and booksellers like I'm sure and I, I don't exactly know how that works you would know better than me Kathy and Jessica but like I'm sure you get the advance video copies like months in advance and uh, and all, all of these things are, are put into place in yeah really early and it's kind of funny as an author to to not see the big picture always and just suddenly to see things just pop out of, out of nowhere <laughs> oh that is so true <laughs> oh, i have a problem with things that are a month ahead and i'm like ah oh, you need that for next month and i'm like but i'm working on something else for right now oh. <laughs> i like to procrastinate okay let's see so what have you got next oh i love this question it's super fun so you guys are writers. I'm assuming you have a life outside of the writing field, um, sort of. Semi, you have a husband, you have a job, you're taking a break. Um, but what do you do when you're not writing? Do you hike? Do you kayak? Do you sit in coffee shops and people watch? Because that's super fun. Um, what do you like to do when you're not writing? I like to garden. I garden all the time. Um, I just built a big cinder block garden in my backyard and I get so much joy out of just watching flowers grow. Um, I, it's kind of bizarre. I love the bugs. I love the birds. I love everything about it. Um, but actually not all that strange. Uh, so I just love gardening. I also play World of Warcraft. So I, I'm kind of all over the place. Um, so I game, I garden, I read, of course. Um, and it's strangely, right now I'm reading spoiler alert, um, strangely enough, which is also about um, the fandom and the world of fandom. So yeah, I, um, yeah, I dabble all over here and there. Spoiler alert is so good. It is so good, yeah. <laughs> Um, I am also an obsessive gardener, Katie, so I am with you. I mean, and I feel like our gardening season in Wisconsin is like, it's like six weeks. I'm like, okay, I'm starting this early. If it freezes, I'm going to be mad, but I'm starting. So anyway, yes, gardening for sure. And I, I have an indoor garden too, um, just in my house. It's nothing fancy, but it's, I obsess over my plants. Um, and I love to dance, but I don't do that as much as I would like. So I would, I'm, my goal is to just start dancing in some capacity, even if it's just Zumba on tape, you know what I mean? On a video, like whatever, just start. Um, I love hiking and, um, oh, I love watching horror flicks with my teen sons. They love them. And they're always introducing me to new horrible horror movies. Um, and I'm a color enthusiast and I love designing and hand knitting my own like knitwear. That's something I can just do sort of brainlessly um, while watching TV or whatever. Just something to do with my hands where I feel like I'm being creative and there's like a really kind of a close end to it on like writing novels, you know, which is like years in, in the making. So, yeah. Um, I spend a lot of time reading, um, watching movies and TV shows. I feel like all of that to me, even though I do it for fun, it's also work because it's always about inspiration and seeing what other people are doing and, and how, yeah, how I can bring that back into my, my own work, I guess. So when I'm not doing that, which is most of my time with writing, um, I'm a very social person uh, and I spend a lot of time just hanging out with friends and I don't even know what we really do. I mean, you know, we go to museums and we go to brunch and we go to, I mean, I, I went to brunch in like freezing temperatures in, in January in New York and not that I enjoyed it, but you know, if it was that or not seeing people, then, you know, I, I just went into <laughs> so put the few layers uh, of clothes on and several pairs of socks and just went anyway. <laughs> um, I used to travel a lot, um, hoping to do a little bit more of that again soon. 
Um, what else do I do? That's kind of, yeah, that's kind of it. I don't really have any other hobbies. I'm like, every time I think about taking up a hobby, I'm like, no, but I should be writing instead of that. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of, I also, I mean, I love going around out and about in New York. Like I could spend hours and hours, like I talk about traveling, but I travel through New York all the time. I like meet people in very different neighborhoods. It was kind of, that was one kind of really good thing, you know, over the pandemic is forced to meet up with people outside and we just would go on really long walks and just always find a different neighborhood. And I feel like it being New York, it's just entertainment. Like being out on the street is entertainment in itself. So I love that. <laughs> I know I'm happy that things are starting to open up more because I'm, I'm a homebody. I like being at home with my plants and my husband and my books and my movies. But there was a certain point where I was like, okay, I miss being around people and being outside. So... I feel like now I'm, there's like all this built up where I'm just going to be like a total going out with people until I burn all that out. And then I'm going to go back to being a homebody. I feel like that's, <laughs> that's what's going to happen to me. Stored up, stored up all of this energy to talk to people. You just need to get rid of it. Well, these chats help. You're people. I get to talk to you. <laughs> So here is a, another question. So what are some ways that readers um, and fans can better support you? They can buy your books, but are, is there anything else they can do to kind of help get the word out that they wouldn't maybe think of? Um, let's see, requesting the library, I think is something that um, people may not uh, realize impacts book sales and is a really great way to show support for a book. Um, likewise, just kind of word of mouth talking with your friends about it. My book is um, very niche. It's, uh, it's for, I mean, there's, there's definitely description of fandom and many of the terms in fandom, but um, I think for those of us that consider ourselves to be introverts, um, it's definitely relatable, but it may not be as relatable to people who are more extroverted. And so I think um, kind of word of mouth there might be the best way. Yeah. Tell your friends. I would say also just okay. like write reviews after you read them. Write, uh, write a review, post on Goodreads and, and Amazon. I didn't really realize the importance of, you know, doing it in both places, the Amazon and Goodreads. So that was a new thing I learned as an author. Um, posting photos of yourself, like just holding the book or um, like on your social media, or um, if you see the book in bookstores, you know, like on a shelf, just having those or little videos. I have a friend who just takes like a little video of, you know, just like pan panoramic video. And of, you know, when she goes, tra she travels a lot too. And so, she, you know, on all her, all her travels, she'll just kind of do that and show my book. And then, you know, I can post it on my own social media. So just little things like that. Um, and then just consider giving books as gifts. But yeah. Yeah, all of those are great. I think that the thing with word of mouth, I think it is still the best form of marketing. Um, and I think people sometimes don't realize it can take so many different shapes, right? It can be um, really like if you're reading something, I think there's this idea that we live our entire lives on social media right now, which I don't think is really true. I think we live like very, very small parts of our lives on social media, but it feels like it's a lot. And I think sometimes just like if you're reading something and, and even like if you love it for sure like talk about it with with your friends but sometimes I'll come across something that feels like it's a good fit for a friend like maybe sometimes I haven't even read it sometimes I'll hear of something and it'll make me think of a friend and it's a great excuse to text her or text her or him and to be like hey I saw this this sounds like it could be a book for you and I don't do, do that just for books but I think for me it's also a nice way to think of people and, and be in touch with them. And I think, yes, and it's the same with social media. I think you can talk about things you're reading. I think sometimes we feel this writing reviews is great, obviously, and there's so many places, Goodreads, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and there's, and it goes, the list goes on. I mean, Goodreads and Amazon are the most important ones, but, but, but you could write reviews anywhere and, and copy and paste it. Um, but I just feel like sometimes um, 
sometimes I'm not the best at knowing how to talk about a book that I really love. Like I'm not a great review writer. <laughs> like it feels like work, I guess, to write reviews. <laughs> No, this is too much. I can't do this. Anyway, but so I feel like just talking a little bit, just saying, hey, I'm reading this. I, I'm enjoying it. I feel like sometimes it's enough for people to, in my teeny tiny platform, I have a lot of friends who sometimes text me and go, oh, I love when you post about things you're reading. I will make make a list of them. And I don't necessarily say, I'll say two, three words about what that book means to me. And sometimes I haven't finished it or whatever. And I feel like that is enough to get people around me to be like, oh, interesting. I might check it out. And people can then go see what it, what it's about. And, you know, they'll they'll find other sources of information. I don't, I don't have to say all the things about the book to make it interesting is what I, I'm trying to say. So I think really just what whichever way you like to express yourself, um, um, talk about something you're reading or enjoying that way. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so let's see, our next question, um, let's see. So besides the, um, oh, I can't think of the word. Uh, so besides the um, experience or information that you already had in your brain um, for your book, did you do any fun or interesting research that you had to touch on a topic that you weren't 100% familiar with? I wouldn't say that I really had to do a lot of research, but I did a lot of um, reminiscing on my con days, um, my days of going to conventions and being immersed in fandom and saving up all my pennies so I could fly to California and go to a Battlestar Galactica convention or a Firefly one or whatnot. Um, so I went through a lot of my old photos and I've looked at what's out there now um, because it's been a while since having kids, I haven't been to as many as uh, conventions. So it was, it was fun to kind of reminisce on um, that, and also, like I said, uh, Down with the Ships fan fiction is based on a prior novel, so I went back to that manuscript and pulled pieces of that that I thought would work nicely in Down with the Ships, so that's kind of where my research took me for this one. Yeah, my, my research was... Um... I, I wanted to make sure that the story was definitely set in contemporary times. Like I really didn't want to just think back to my experiences and part of it is just, you know, the, the whole act of writing fiction. It has to be really quite different from what my lived experiences were for me to, I don't know how memoirists do it. I am like in so in awe of memoirists because I just am not a memoirist. I, I'm So I really needed to make sure that the story would feel really grounded in the present day. So it involved a lot of sort of like reading, you know, modern, like um, personal essays in the New York Times about, you know, relationships and also doing a little bit of research on relationship culture in on both high school and college campuses. Um, and so that was a really interesting part of my, um, of my research. And of course, just reading a lot of other YA fiction, you know, just to immerse yourself in the, you know, the voice of teens. And I have teen kids and we are sort of the hangout house too. So there are a lot of teens here all the time. So that was, that was helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's so much out there now. I mean, it's just so easy actually to find out about it. The internet is like the best thing ever for writers, you know, because you really can visit anywhere, go anywhere, learn about anything. Um, not that it just it's all about internet, you know, in terms of research, but it is a nice starting off point, jumping off point um, in terms of research. Um, what were the other things I wanted to mention? Oh, and just lots of conversations with young people about their relationships. I was actually surprised with how like forthcoming a lot of people were about their experiences with race and bias um, with regards to some of their personal um, experience, personal relationships. So that was really cool to just have tons of, you know, hours of conversations with kids who and teens who are going through things that Ronnie and Oliver both went through, so. Mine was um, very research in intensive. I did not do ballet, so I had to learn a lot of <clears throat> a lot of the moves. I had to read books, uh, watch documentaries, um, watch a lot of YouTube videos. I think I've, you know there's the internet for sure, but like YouTube specifically is such an incredible resource because anything you want to learn about, someone's made a hundred videos in great detail about, like literally anything that exists, like well, at least anything that I've ever searched for. 
<laughs> I can't speak for the entire universe. Um, but anyways, and I found it found it very helpful to be able to pose and to to really um, look at the steps and also just hearing ballet dancers. And I, I spoke to ballet dancers in real life as well, but I just felt like it was quite helpful to to listen to like interviews and things like that. So that was the ballet aspect. Um, then there was the Dugat aspect. So I did a lot of research on Dugat as well and on paintings. And I think I just felt strongly that I wanted the, um, to describe the right painting in the right museum and the right era and, and, and all of these things. Um, and, and then there was Paris. And so I went there actually while I was writing the book. I mean, as, as an excuse, I, I would have gone there anyway, but I went there specifically, I guess, for this. There was a, a very big Degas exhibition at the Musée d'Orsay. Um, so that was great. And just like really spending time, like walking the streets. And I, want, I really wanted the setting to be as authentic as possible. I think I just really felt that pressure as a French person that my Paris had to be extra, extra authentic, um, <laughs> especially since I've read so many Paris set or French uh, France set stories that just kind of felt like uh, this is, is this really France or is this how, is it, how it is in your imagination <laughs> so I just felt like I wanted my Paris to be the, as, as real as I could make it on on paper so I also when I was back home spent so much time on Google Maps really figuring out like where is the dorm where she's staying and what you know, subway station is she, is she, you know, what subway is she taking and where is she changing to the next line? And actually she could be walking that distance and how long it would take. And, and you know, these are really small details in the book that the vast majority of readers wouldn't notice, but it meant something to me that, that I was trying to make that as authentic as possible. Yeah, Google Maps is amazing because you can do the street view I do that for some places like, do I want to live there? And I'll like look up an address and look at the street view. It's like, would I like this? Would I like walking down the street? <laughs> Does this say me? It's fantastic. <laughs> exactly. I wish it told you, it might actually tell you when they took. Yes. Like the videos. There's usually a then it's like, okay, what season is this? Am I going to like this area in this season? Like, what am I going to be wearing? <laughs> Can I wear my Birkenstocks? <laughs> it looks like I'll need some scarves. I'll have to go shopping. I'm planning for like an entire life because of Google Maps. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, our next question. So you shared before about your writing journey to become a writer. So if you could tell your younger writing self, so the, the writer that didn't know if they were going to actually be a writer, who was trying to become a writer, if you could tell them anything, reassure them, give them advice, what would it be? Well, looking back just to kind of my experience, um, I remember feeling that, always feeling that I was kind of the oddball because I preferred to sit in a hammock and get lost in a Star Wars novel um, or my old copy of Jurassic Park. And I, if I could look back and say something to myself, I think it would be that you may not be aware of this, but what you're doing is preparing yourself for something that's going to come. Um, and that it's okay that you don't want to be in the lake or be playing tennis or um, involved in this club after school or whatnot, that it's okay that you're drawn to this, that's acceptable. And there's a purpose behind it. And I think that those might've been words that um, would have been a lot to me when I was much younger, because I think there was, I felt a lot of pressure to be doing something else, though it didn't fit right for me. Um, so I wish I could go back and just kind of say that to myself, um, that I was, I was building my imagination, working to something that would, um, that yeah, I was going to become more involved with than I could ever imagine then. I love that. <clears throat> I would probably say, um, I just remember spending a lot of time doubting myself, you know, my entire childhood. I, you know, my family, um, so I grew up in an immigrant family. And there was definitely a sense of pick something practical and just, you know, there's, we don't have family here. We don't have any like, you know, safety nets or anything to fall back on. We left everything behind for us to, for you to be here and for you to get a really great education, for you to do something really practical and something where we don't have to worry. 
And of course, that's understandable. But then, of course, like as a writer, as a reader, it just felt like that was was all seen as kind of fluffy, you know, like stuff to do on the side. And and I did do it on the side for a long for many, many years. But I there was always that sort of thread of self-doubt, like, oh, am I just being like, you know what? You know, I should just I don't know. There was I wasn't totally sure of myself and um I think though, if you write into the heart of your obsessions or, you know, write into the heart of like those questions that won't let you go, that are, that sort of grab you by the throat and you, you know, are sort of knocking down the walls of your heart, you, you're writing for yourself and you're learning so much about yourself and, you know, whatever those questions are, they're important. They're important to your sense of self. And so I think that that would have been so helpful to hear somebody say, you're doing this for a good reason. Just do it and don't question yourself and don't take 15 years, which is what I, <laughs> what I did. I, fit, I, I wrote it over stolen moments, you know, really late at night or early in the morning. And I, I mean, that's kind of very typical, I think, for writers to fit it into these little corners of their life. But it would have been nice to have um, given myself sort of permission to just go for it and just believe in it. And I think on some level I did believe in it, but it um, it was muddled in there, you know, with a lot of sort of negative stuff. So I would just say to kind of, you know, write for yourself and that that's actually a really important part of your development and your sense of self and your sense of like well-being almost. So. Yeah, I feel I feel quite similarly. And I think the the other thing I would say for me is I really wish I had I think I had this idea of writing should come naturally and it's sort of a thing you're like kind of a born a writer and it's about talent. And I think over the years I've really come to believe that it's not, um, or at least a very small part of it is. And I think I wish I had set up and I still I don't think it, I still don't think I have one, but like a really a writing practice. I think I, I wish I'd really much early on in my life. I think I've, I've, I've always had like writing related things. Like I would, I worked for a newspaper when I was in college, you know, like all of these things, but I really wish I had thought about what do I want to write? When do I want to write it? What's, what's a good place? And I don't mean like just physically, but that what's a good place for me to write? Like, and, and, and by place, I mean like, I don't know, like, I mean, yes, like where, where can I write, but also what time, but also in, in what context and also what sort of stories and in what format. And I, I wish I'd asked myself, uh, myself all of these questions because I felt like I was for a long time, just kind of not really sure. And I think I would always do jobs on deadline. I mean, I have had deadlines for, you know, many, many years. And I feel like those, those have driven me. Um, but I feel like when it was just writing my own things, it was always such a, you know, like, I guess more of a drag just because I didn't really know how to put it into a process. And I think um, my last book, the one that I was, that's coming out in full 2022, I wrote it under a reasonably tight deadline. And I think what was quite good about that is I really saw the process in very, you know, at, at like in a, in a very fast way, right? I saw myself write the terrible first draft and very quickly turn it into a slightly less terrible draft and very quickly turn it, you know, and I'm still going through that, you know, I'm uh, through that process right now. Um, but I think that's really helped me to see, you can go through the mode, like to, to see, like to see myself going through the motions, like, okay, this this is my process and, and this is fine. And, and it's fine to write the really bad stuff because there is a way at some point. <laughs> at some point to turn it into something okay <laughs> and then better <laughs> um so yeah i think that's um yeah that i think that's what i would tell my younger self <laughs> i love everything that you say and i hope that there's like one aspiring writer who happens to watch this panel so they can get all of that advice <laughs> like in one pretty package <laughs> oh Okay, so our next question. So are there any books out now or that are coming out now that you yourself are excited about and want to share with our viewers? I'm super excited for Never Saw You Coming by Erin Hahn. Um, it's another young adult book and I want to say that it, the arc is out now. Yes, because I know I have it on my channel at home. Um, and I am super excited about it because I think that it is 
um, about the concept of healing from religious trauma, which I think is really fascinating. And I'm super excited to read a book that um, I know I can personally uh, make connection to, but also kind of to see how she handles it because she's such a strong writer, particularly with her um, romances. So I can't wait to see how she juggles this really heavy uh, idea in there. Um, I'm also really excited for Lauren Blackwood's Within These Wicked Walls. It's the Ethiopian um, Jane Eyre retelling that I'm so excited about because I love Jane Eyre so much. It's one of my favorites. Um, there's, there's one of those, um, those dangerous love stories right there, right? Yeah. Um, and the other one I wrote down was Lake's Edge by Lyndall Clipstone. I'm super excited for that one. What are those monster romance stories? Very excited for those three. I love Jane Eyre too. Yeah. Yeah, this was a hard one. I mean, there's there. I mean, my gosh, there's just so many great books coming out. Um, one I'm reading now that I'm loving is by Brianna Bourne um, called You and Me at the End of the World. So that comes out really soon. Um, I'm reading and these are already out, but I'm reading and loving them. Um, Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas and Grown by Tiffany Jackson. They're just blowing me away. Um, and then in terms of romance, I guess I'm, I'm really excited to read um, A Fall Love Story by Lone Lay, Lay and um, Hot British Boyfriend. That's another one that's been on my TBR for a long time. Uh, Quantum Weirdness of The Almost Kiss. That's about childhood BFFs. And that's like totally one of my favorite tropes also. Um, and what was the other one I wanted to mention? Gosh, there's so many. Where It All Lands is another one. That's about split timelines. So that, that to me is a really interesting trope. Um, there's one that's about a sex pact, a sex pact called The Night When No One Had Sex by Kalina Miller. And so I'm really looking forward to that one. And a poetry one is Words Composed of Salt and Sky. That's another one that I've been waiting for. So I'm reading um, that one right now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I just like, you know, just named like 10 books, but such a <laughs> place. Yeah, I read uh, Hot, that you've mentioned. I read Hot British Boyfriend, which was really, really, really cool and fun. And I'm reading um, Words Composed of Sea and Sky right now. Um, a few, um, and it is beautiful, um, a few that I've read lately. Um, I read, um, so it, this one just came out this week. It's called Tokyo Ever After by Emiko Jin. And it's basically Prince's Diaries set in Japan. And like, it, I think it's pitched at Prince's Diaries meet, meets um, Crazy Rich Asians. And I think that's a, a, great, mm. uh, a great description for it. It's really fun. It's really, really fun. And it just came out this week. It was the Reese's, um, Reese Witherspoon's book club pick for, for the season, which I um, was not surprised uh, to hear that because it's, uh, it's just a really, really fun story. Um, and I also, talking about fun stories, I recently finished um, Dial A for Aunties by Jesse Q. Sutanto, which is just pure like joy and fun and family love and murder mystery weirdness. And it's just like completely bonkers in the best possible way. And it's like, you know, so it's so funny because so much of it is like, if you're looking for like, a traditional murder mystery this is probably not for you uh, but it's just like I, I bought it from day one like um, all the I don't want to spoil it but like from the dead body to like you know from all, all around um, I think it was just such a wild and entertaining read um, a ballet story if anyone um, here is interested in ballet that I uh, a ballet story that I just I recently finished as well is the other side of perfect um, by Mariko Turk. It's about a Asian American girl who has to give up ballet, who was very passionate about ballet and who has to give it up because she was injured. And it's like sort of that coming to terms with the idea of like A, losing your dream, but also realizing that there's, there were a lot of things that were really wrong with that dream. And, you know, because ballet is such a white centric um, industry and, and art, performing art, I guess. Um, what else? Um, I'm also start reading. Um, I mean, if you ask writers what they're reading, like then we could spend the whole hour on this, right? Like we could do another <laughs> round. <laughs> I'll finish with this one. I've started reading um, Jason June's. Um, it's called Jay's Gay Agenda, 
about a, a teen who finally comes out as um, as gay and who I guess has a sets an agenda for himself about what he's going to do now that he's he's out to his family and it was fairly drama free and 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 what's next um, uh, for him and it's I'm, I'm just a few pages in but it's just again like the voice is extremely fun and all of it is just like leaping off the page and I know this is going to be a, a wild ride as well. <laughs> Those are all such great recommendations. I feel like I'm going to have to look all of them up and add them all. I can read them all. I'm going to have so many more books to read. I think Kathy and I both perked up when we heard Brianna Bourne because we're going to have her for a chat in August. So we're excited about that one. That's awesome. But I think after this, I'm going to make like a list of all the books you recommended so that people can just click and go right to them. I think that'll be a good idea. That is what I will do. Yay. Okay, so we are going to the end. So we're going to have our closing questions. So this is the question that we always ask and we love to ask because we love hearing about how much people like libraries because it makes us really happy. So what is your favorite library memory? I have a very vivid memory um, from back in, it must have been somewhere in the mid 90s. Um, I'm also going to age myself here. Um, before the young adult section existed, and I remember walking from the children's section and then seeing um, a, a bookshelf and realizing, wait, there's a fantasy section over there. There was, a, I don't think there was as much sci fi then, but I, I saw the coverage and I was like, wait, wait, this is where I'm supposed to be now. Um, and then from there, eventually, Twilight coming out and that, that watching that young adult section then um, emerge and everybody kind of pushing books out of the way so we can now have this big booming section. But I remember realizing, oh, I, I what felt like I was leveling up to adult books at that point. Um, that just, I don't know why that always stuck with me. And I think that was a cool moment looking back, um, now seeing how libraries have changed. But now I think it's really, my fondest memories and the reasons why I'm going to the library almost every week is to fill my massive LL Bean bag full of picture books um, because my kids and I have so much fun reading all of these incredible books that are coming out. I mean, the illustrations, they are so inspiring. They're just so, I, I just, I geek out over kids' books. I love them. Um, my favorite library memory is one that is based on when I was really young. Um, so we lived near this quaint little kind of a business strip. There was really, there was really not much. There was like, they called it like a five and dime, like a variety store. There was like, you know, a pharmacy. Um, but there was also a little teeny tiny library. And so my mom and I would go, we would go to the like the library story hour. And I so vividly like remember sitting on the rug and you know having that same librarian read, and then we'd my mom and I would spend time you know choosing books and fill up our bag, and then you know just just kind of even like the smell of the library like I just remember that so it was such a huge part of my childhood basically just that um, the joy of like walking there every you know every week and sort of bringing back the books that I had finished and it just seems sort of like how does this kind of a thing exist you know we just get to take these books home and don't have to pay for them it just the whole thing felt really like magical and um and then we'd of course go next door to the little bakery and would get a cookie so that did not hurt either um in terms of making it like best memory ever but yeah that was a big part of my childhood mm -hmm. See, I grew up in the country, like I, I mentioned before, I think, and there were no libraries around. Not that I don't think I knew libraries were really a thing until I was much, much older. I think one of my first memories, I would say, was um, my high school library. Um, and this is usually, you know, I'd go and like chat with my friends and consider with my friends when we were doing like late homework, to be completely honest. But I think one of my first memories was like going through all the books. I don't know how you call them, but like, or like, I guess we call them like orientation books about like what you could study and like what, you know, what, yeah, what kind of studies we could be doing like post high school and just like 
imagining our futures and just like daydreaming through all the books was really fun. Um, I mean, I have a few like a few library me memories. I think then um, later on in life when I lived in Melbourne, this was really the first time where I lived like five minutes walk from a library and just kind of discovering that this was a place where you could just really easily go and just borrow books, for, you know, for free or for, I don't, I don't remember. I think, I think it was free. Um, and, and it was, and, and just sit there and it was quite a beautiful space and just have, you know, magazines and all of these things that you could just sit there and read for hours and it was fine. And it was, you know, no one would, would, uh, would come tell you to go, I guess. <laughs> I really, really love that. And then there was actually like one of the, in the city, that inside Melbourne there was this absolutely gorgeous library that was I don't I don't know exactly how to describe it but it was like on the top floor and it had like a dome um like a like it's just a beautiful space to just be in and this is what I was talking before about just loving books as objects just being in spaces like that makes me feel happy and I think I felt exactly the same way when I first walked into the the New York public public library in New York and I mean the the main one the one that everyone would would know and picture with the lions and just walking in that space for the first time and again thinking like this is a place where you can just really go like anyone can go there it's kind of amazing when you think about it anyone can go there and spend a lot of time surrounded by the books and I think that's really cool <laughs> so yeah a few a few different library memories <laughs> no they're all wonderful thank you for sharing it's so nice to hear them <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so give us a little peek or let us know what is coming up next for you. What are we working on? Working on another contemporary that's um, a very Arizona specific story um, about kind of one of these little neighborhoods that's nestled um, south of the city, um, kind of past this mountain range that we at one point was called, or we're calling a, a big cul de sac because. It was just kind of one little pocket of Phoenix, um, very focused on that, that area. But it's about a game that um, a number of the seniors play in the local high schools, um, a game that gets rather competitive and kind of wild at times. Um, and it, my first thought as I'm drafting is, hey, I'm going to make this a rom-com. But strangely enough, I've been on kind of a, a true crime kick. And now I'm thinking, no, this needs to be a thriller. We need to have something go wrong. Um, so I'm, so it's very much still this strange thing that exists in my brain, but, um, but it's coming together into something quite nice with uh, some sibling rivalry thrown into the mix, which I love. I love um, sibling relationships and delving into those, strengthening them, sometimes breaking them apart and hopefully rebuilding them better. Um, and so I'm kind of toying with some of that uh, as, as I'm working on this idea, but it's still kind of in the planning process, but um, I'm really enjoying these characters so far. Yeah, my next book is some sibling um, stuff going on. So that's exciting. Mine is actually a, a, a different genre. So I, um, and I want to talk about it, but I I feel like I shouldn't yet. Um, all I can say is I'm really completely in love with it. It does feel really like there's a lot of energy behind it. And um, it is, I'm sort of at that stage where I'm like, it's keeping me up at night. I like come up with a piece of the puzzle and, you know, get onto my computer. So it's a little, I'm tired, but I mean, it's, it's also a really exciting point, you know, where you're sort of piecing the whole story together. I, I do feel like I want to be a little bit less of a plotter. Uh, I'm sorry, a pantser this time around. Um, so that's been kind of a new experience. I'm using Story Genius and I'm using Save the Cat um, writes the novel and to just help with story structure. And so that's actually been kind of an interesting and cool challenge to just force myself to really flesh out what do I want, you know, what is the story about? What were the scenes, you know, how do we keep things, on, you know, pacey? Um, and I'm finding that's actually more freeing than I thought it would be. Um, there's something that's sort of relaxing to just look at my outline and go, okay, that's sort of the blueprint. I don't have to stress about, oh my gosh, what comes next? Or I can sort of just relax into the scene and allowing myself to kind of go in a slightly different direction, but not what I did 
you know, with my previous book, which was like total pantsing, no paying attention to any conventions, writing. It was like tw twice the length of a normal YA by the time I was, it was just, oh my gosh, never again. So I'm hoping that this is going to keep me on track and so far so good. And it's, it's feeling really exciting. So. Mm -hmm. Um, mine, I really don't know how much I can say about it. I keep getting asked this question and I keep meaning to ask my editor what I can say and I, I always forget. So I will always, I will only say, so it's young adult, it's romance. Um, it's not a sequel to Kisses and Croissants. I get asked that a lot. Um, there is a somewhat connection uh, in the sense that instead of an American girl going to Paris, this is about a French American girl coming to New York. I'll say that. Um, I don't think I've said that before, but you're, now it's out. <laughs> um, the, the theme, I know this is recorded and this is going to live on forever. So, <laughs> um, so here it is. Um, the food is a very big theme. So again, if people thought there was a lot of French food in Kisses and Croissants, this is like multiples of that. And yeah, it's also very big city energy, lots of love for New York, um, pre-pandemic days, I will say. Um, it was kind of a weird thing to, to write during a pandemic because, or during the pandemic, um, the only one I know, um, and because it, 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 we sort of pitched it in December 2019 and I ended up working on it for a lot of um, 2020, early, 20, early this year as well. And I think it just felt like this, again, I don't want to say too much about it, but this kind of story just could not have worked if it wasn't um, in the before days. So it was very much like writing New York and writing life, like a contemporary in a world that didn't, during a time where that world didn't really exist anymore. So that was, that was interesting. And it didn't really allow me to do like on-site research, even though I was and I am here um, in New York. So, but anyway, so um, I, I still have a lot of rounds of revisions ahead of me. So it might be a completely different story by the time it comes out. Who knows? But I think food, food in New York and romance is um, should those three elements really should stay. I hope. <laughs> and that's out fall twenty twenty two, and that's also with um, Random House, De La Press. And again, the the timing might change. We'll see. <laughs> everything can change <laughs> it's publishing <laughs> you know I always feel like until the book is printed the, the book can change and until it's out on the shelves the date can change so yeah well those all sound amazing and I can't wait and I love how we only know a little bit so we're intrigued mm -hmm. maybe after we're no longer live we'll maybe get some hints we'll see so thank you to everyone watching with us live, everyone watching this when it's recorded. Thank you to our wonderful authors. We're so honored that you spent all this time with us and even went a little bit over the time. Everyone watching, you can purchase and pre-order books by the authors from the Rit Bodice Bookstore or a local bookseller near you. You can also check it out from your library. If they don't have it, you can request that they get it. Definitely do that. <laughs> That's one of the things that I did. I made sure that we ordered everybody's books that we were talking to, even if we didn't have them right away, we would have them, period. So thank you. Sure. Thank you. That means a lot. That means sure. it's, it's very uh, exciting. I, I feel very, it's very exciting to me to see books in different locations, you know, to see my book like in different places. Um, places I haven't been to, places that are very different to where I am. I think that's, you know, I love, I love knowing that it's on a bookshelf in Escondido. I think that's very cool. <laughs> Excellent. I'll take a photo when I get my hands on it. Do, do. We ordered it, but for some reason it has pose with it. We should eat croissants. Yes, yes. Oh. That Excellent. We can go it's to- It's just the an excuse for me to eat a croissant. <laughs> <laughs> we can go to the Delight of Friends. Go there. There's a wait for your book, Anne Sophie. Mm -hmm. There's a wait. It's I, there's gosh, there's a list for it, and so people are definitely dying to read it, which I love. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. If you are out there and you're interested in more free online programming like this, don't forget to check out um, our Facebook events to see all the fun and free digital events that we have planned coming up. 
Uh, we hope to see you next week on Saturday, May 29th for our live chat with authors. Oh my gosh, I've never even, uh, Oriane de Sombre and uh, Miel Moreland. Um, if you get a chance, uh, please fill out our virtual program survey. That always helps us improve our programs and add new things or take things you don't like away. Um, we love your opinion. Uh, the link is in our chat description and pasted into the comments. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us, Kathy and Jessica. This was fun. This was amazing, Kathy and Jessica. <laughs> That's us, Kathy and Jessica. It's one name now. Kathy Jessica.